Okay. <laughs> so who all you talk to while you're here? Uh, you're the only one. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I had to get with you if I could. Somebody was asking me the other day about, uh, said, hey, you created Dr. Tomorrow. Is it okay if we use that character? I'm like, I don't remember Doc, if my life depended on it. I don't remember. I remember everything about every comic book I ever read, mm -hmm. but the ones I wrote, that's a whole different kettle of fish, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm actually, uh, probably about a quarter of these questions are actually going to be about your time as an editor, so hopefully that's your fine. game's fine too. Okay. Amazing. Excerpt from the 1997 edition of the Jones and Jacobs comic book heroes. For a tense, crackling moment, everyone was united, even by hostility. One embodiment of that brittle energy was Mark Wade, a fanboy who'd been electrified by Alan Moore and dreamed of bigger things for comics. Groth hired him to take Ulbricht's place at the head of Amazing Heroes. That had always been Fantagraphics' straight-up-the-middle fan magazine. Now Wade brought in the spirit of 86 and turned it into an impudent, intelligent, controversial forum for the improvement of the mainstream, a superhero-oriented equivalent of the journal. Another fissure, art versus commerce, elitist versus fanboy. Mark Wade had barely begun revamping Amazing Heroes when disagreements between him and Groth boiled over, and Groth canned him. Groth would choose meeker and more market-minded editors after that. Fandom was growing. Wags noted that with every convention, the geek factor went down and the babe factor went up. And it was true that the greater world was finding its way into comics. The number of new converts was still small enough to be absorbed into the subculture, but that couldn't last. A new breed of slick, pro-mainstream magazines about comics was appearing. And Mark Wade, lately fired from Amazing Heroes, was hired to create one by a group of young capitalists from outside fandom. Then Mark Wade got the call he'd been waiting his entire life for. DC was planning a creator own line and wanted him to interview for the editor's job. As it turned out, the job would go to a friend of Jeanette Kahn's from the garment trade, but Wade and another interviewee, Brian Augustine, were hired as associate editors for the DC mainstream. Wade and Augustine became instant soulmates, both Silver Age fans, both cocky, and unintimidated by anybody, both used to being loudmouth outsiders. Wade specialized in ingenious subversion. He tried to slip stories into his pet title, Secret Origins, that undermined John Byrne's Superman continuity. He hired normal man's Jim Valentino, Stig's Inferno's Ty Templeton, a clever satirical cartoonist named Hilary Barda, and others do their spins on superheroes. Wade and Augustine were among the last editors to give work to veterans who'd fallen out of favor in the slick and serious days. Kurt Swan, Kurt Schaffenberger, Don Heck, and Carmine Infantino. Wade's conversion to grittiness had come too late. He was fired by DC for too many in-print jokes and insubordinations. He'd have to fight his way back into comics as a freelance writer. When Wade took over Flash, he put his whole melancholy heart and ingenious brain into it. It was a modern comic book in many ways, with long, complex story arcs full of reality warps, cliffhangers, and soap opera. But it was also full of super speed gimmicks straight out of John Broom, sentimentality for the lost father figure of Barry Allen, and a constant reaffirmation of the sense of heroic duty that underlay 60s comics. Now stated far more earnest than ever in Broom's stories, for Wade was defying the dominant culture where Broom had been toying with it. When Mike Wieringo, an artist with a heavily cartoon style reminiscent of Todd McFarlane's, but without the terror and twisted torment, joined Wade in 1993, word began to spread that something refreshing, something fun, was going on in Flash. It didn't steal many kids from Image, but for middle-aged readers, it recovered some of the excitement they remembered from the Silver Age. As slightly younger fans found it to be a step forward from relentless adolescent grimacing, sales rose slowly but surely, and Wade rose in the fan polls until he was unseating even Peter David and Neil Gaiman. Wade and the charming cartoonist Umberto Ramos soon spun off Impulse, a breezily funny series about a teenage speedster from the far future stuck in an Alabama high school. In the figure of the outcast but imperturbable Impulse, being mentored by Flash and another older speedster, Wade created the perfect fantasy version of the old-time comic book geek, learning from Silver Age superheroes how to endure adolescent idiocy and prepare for a better future. Wade would give up higher profile and higher paying jobs like X-Men, would even take on Brian Augustine as a co-writer on Flash, but nothing could pry him from Impulse. Mark Wade, who'd impressed most of his peers and critics as the best writer in the superhero genre with his Flash and Captain America, looked like the rising star of the X titles when Harris recruited him. After Wade declined Lobdell's offers to mentor him in mutant writing, however, hostilities broke out. Eventually, Wade gave up an estimated $120,000 a year rather than continue the war. The real torchbearers of the old superheroes, the twin favorites of adult fandom, have been two slow-rising and late-blooming scholars from 70s fandom, Mark Wade and Kurt Busiek. Their book ends, smart and garrulous, round and funny, more passionate about superhero comics than life itself, easily mocked as fanboys but amusedly impervious to the mockery. Their opposites, too. 
Wade the yearning romantic who built a phantom zone projector to escape from the limbo of American adolescence. Buzik the analyst who joined Carol Kalish's sales force when his writing career wasn't taking off. Between them, they give form to all the dreams of those fans who endure all the trends and booms and busts and remain loyal to their heroes. As the industry kept falling, Kurt Buzik and Mark Wade kept rising. Marvels had made Buzik, in his own words, a hot writer after 11 years in the business. Alex Ross, meanwhile, moved on to Kingdom Come with Mark Wade. DC intended it as an exploitation of the Marvel's audience, but Wade and Ross made it still more millennialist and more hopelessly nostalgic. Kingdom Come was profoundly conservative, devoted to order and old codes, fearing chaos and upheaval. Yet there was no air of menace in Kingdom Come. It was a sweet but sad story, affirming the old ethics of kids' entertainment, even while it acknowledged that the heroes who come to save us from savagery are themselves visitors from the past, not leaders for the future. When it debuted in May 1996, its first issue sold over 200,000 copies, making it the hot comic in a cold market. It even broke out of the comic book ghetto to pick up some national media attention and some sales to ex-fans and casual readers. But whenever Wade did a radio interview, he did so as a comic book trivia expert, a novelty act who could tell people that Captain Marvel was modeled after Fred McMurray. At the time these excerpts were written, there was a real sense of impending doom, a question about where comics and Mark Wade's career was going to go from here. As it turns out, a quarter of a century later, Mark Wade and the industry are still doing fine. And in fact, Wade has become a fixture on top writers of all time lists in the comic book industry. He remains incredibly prolific. It's still a get on any given book. I could go into greater detail on that, but I think we've already taken up enough time with the preamble. My sincere hope is that I do get to interview Wade again someday because with a career as long as his and with a wealth of knowledge as deep as his, a half hour conversation just doesn't seem nearly enough. The interview is conducted on May 26th, 2018 at Houston's Comic Palooza. Material has been edited for time and content. So first off, uh, how did you manage to convince Julie Schwartz to publish your first work in action comics? <laughs> You know what it was? I got lucky. Uh, I, DC was doing a, a little outreach for talent at that time in, in the all over the nation. They were sending out an uh, art director named Sal, Sal Amendola, who was Dick Giordano, his brother-in-law, was running that program and going to different cities around convention time and just take like a half an hour, a half a half a day seminar, just talking about getting your portfolio ready, what it takes to work in comics, and all that stuff. And uh, I went, even though I wasn't an artist. And afterwards, I went up to him and I said, "So I'm a writer. What do you, you know? What do you think?" He says, "Well, what about, you know? What he says? Submit Superman stories because at that point, nobody's submitting Superman stories. Everybody wants to do Batman and all that stuff, and nobody's doing Superman. So that sounded like a good bet. I got some ideas together, and then I went up to New York and I got in Julie Schwartz's office and I talked to him a few times as a reporter for the fan press and stuff." And talked to him and, and sold him the story like the first rattle out of the box. The greatest professional day of my life. So that was great. Uh, how did you end up editing Amazing Heroes? Um, I was a big contributor to that magazine for a long time. And really, it, it, it wasn't like a very competitive job. It's not, not a whole lot of people who were willing to, to move all the way out to Thousand Oaks, California and you know, live in somebody's house. and Because the offices were in just a, a you know, somebody's... A, 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 ranch house, ranch house. Um, and I got hired I went out there was all excited and I will never forget my first job to my surprise my first job was to fire the guy I replaced they didn't tell me that it sounds like a sitcom plot but really I come in and they're like okay and it's your first job tell him he's gone what the what? that was literally the pilot of news radio yeah it really exactly I lived the pilot I was I was yes I was Dave yep <laughs> yep uh, what was the deal with Comics Week? Oh man, that was well intended. It was. I think at that point there was a need for a magazine that was doing comics coverage weekly because there was so much coming out and things were in such a boom period. Uh, so I convinced a guy who had some money uh, to do this. It was a giant tabloid-sized thing, but it was on super flimsy paper. So it was just, you can't... It, it was a terrible marketing decision. You can't make them stand up straight. They're, they're just, they'll keel over at the, at the slightest wind. Um, and we did five issues in seven weeks, so, so much for weekly. Uh, and near the end, I mean, the guy who put down the money is like, this is, I can't do this. Uh, and it wasn't that he was losing money. We didn't have any, any sales data yet or anything. It just, he, this wasn't the thing for him. So, um, boy, that was a well-intended experiment that went horribly bad. The, the real casualty of it was uh, um, was um, I'm sorry I can't believe Kevin Nolan because Kevin Nolan did a cover for the last issue that I, I asked him to do and he got it back eventually 
the publisher folded it into fours and stuffed it in an envelope and sent it back to him. So, what was it? It was an X Men cover. It's a beautiful X Men cover, but you know it, that's that's all you'll ever see of it. Yeah. Do you have any stories from your editing days uh, related to Jack Schiff and his time on the Manhunter from Mars strip? I don't really actually. I mean, I, I, I as you know, I'm a huge Mars Manhunter fan. Who, if all right-minded people are, from yeah. the idle head of Diabolo all the way up. Um, but no, I never got a chance to meet Schiff, which is a shame. And uh, but I spent a lot of time. One of the first things I did when I got to DC was uh, get in the library and spent like a couple of days literally rereading every Marsh Manhunter story ever from the very beginning. And they were wild. They were great. And it clearly they had no idea what they wanted to do with that strip for a long, long time. Back and forth all over the map. But it was a lot of fun. Okay, you essentially took over Roy Thomas's books when DC Riley decided the position of writer-editor should never have been a thing. Uh, you both had come from a hardcore comic fandom, both as writing and editing. Uh, did you learn anything from that experience, basically taking over from a fan from an earlier generation than you? Um, I, I, yeah, the thing I learned, and I'll never forget this, is that the books, through no fault of Roy's, I mean, it wasn't the right time for those books anymore, but the, the books weren't selling terribly well. Um, and I was still enjoying reading them, even as a editor. I was and I went up to, to Dick Giordano, who was the executive editor at the time. I said, Dick, what, what is it about these books that I really enjoy reading, even though they're, we can't get the best artists anymore, and and they're, they're not super popular, and I don't, they're not great comics. No offense to anybody working on them, but they're just not great comics. How do you? Why is it I'm enjoying writing, reading them so much? And Dick said, because Roy would do it for free, and it shows. I'm like that's awesome, and I've never forgotten that. That's actually you can't fake enthusiasm. And I know when I'm writing, if I'm not having a fun time doing it, if I'm just kind of dragging my way through the script, I, I need to stop and close up the laptop and go walk around the block and have fun because you can that translates on the page. So, what stories from Secret Origins were you most proud of? And can you tell me about any lost unpublished tales from that run? Sure, there were there were a few lost ones. Uh, the, the the most famous one is I gave James Robinson his first work in comics, doing the Dinosaur Island one. Uh, that was all apparently all drawn and for whatever reason never saw print because I get they canceled the book after I left um, but there were there were a bunch of golden age ones that were in various stages of completion but none of them were were good to go uh, some of them were at that point we were having a hard time getting vital younger artists interested in doing the golden age characters especially like the second and third tier ones and so you know you you farm you give a script out to some guy who was fairly new and he'd come back and it would just be not professional quality so a lot of that sort of sitting in the drawers um gil kane did breakdowns on a lot of stories a couple of three stories that were never finished but that's because you can't finish a gil kane story because when he does layouts what he, he literally on typing paper he'll with a magic marker wow. he'll just do like breakdowns and he'll, or he'll take the you know do a, that on the printed page but again he's just working on in, in super super limited so and Gil would do super rough stuff so you couldn't finish only Gil could know what those lines meant on paper um, that's but my favorite moment in that series my favorite thing I commissioned was Ty Templeton doing uh, the origin of the Legion of Substitute Heroes because I known Ty for a long time I love Ty's work he's a brilliant man and I met him at a Chicago convention and I said hey do this you know 19 pages here's the date you know do all the art do the writing just you know I'm and so time goes by, and time goes by, and i kind of forgotten about it. And then one day, 19 inked, lettered pages ready to print show up in the mail. I didn't look at the script or anything, but that's okay. It's time. I knew it was going to, and it was. It was the best story we ran in there. And of course, I got, the, my, my bosses were screaming at me and yelling at me, like, why didn't you see the script ahead of time? Didn't you, shouldn't you approve the pencils? All that and he, normally, yes, but I'm working with a genius. So why am I, and it's no big deal. But that was a great gig. That was a, that, I loved the people I was able to bring into the industry. I loved the new writers I was working with. And it taught me so much as a budding writer because I'm working with every writer there is at DC Comics and watching all these scripts come across my desk. And it was like boot camp. I mean, I learned more doing that in, in a couple of years than I would have in 10 years on my own. We didn't get a secret origin of Aquaman. We got the legend of Aquaman. Right. Well, that was going to be, exactly. Well, we was going to be an annual. But for whatever reason, I think... You know, I don't even remember what the reason was. I know, no, I know what the reason was because it was so beautiful. Really, it was such a beautiful job. That was I was the I, the guy who said Kurt Swan, named by Eric Shanauer, was going to be beautiful, and nobody believed me. But it was gorgeous. It's the best inking job Kurt had gotten in 20 years. 
and I love Kurt Juan. I love Kurt Juan beyond all reasons. I wanted him to be taken care of. So when the pages came in and we saw how beautiful they were, you know, uh, Secret Origins was still on newsprint, you know, still, but we decided these, this needs to be on a nicer paper. This needs to be have a nicer presentation. So that's how we got the legend of Aquaman. I, Alve inked him on the miniseries, and Alve is one of my favorite inkers of all time, and it still doesn't compare to what Schenauer did on the special. With all, yeah, I mean, Al's terrific, but just Eric, there was just a magic. I, and I knew it, because again, as a student of Kurt's work, and I got a bunch of different people to ink Kurt on Secret Origins, because everybody wanted to, because they understood there's a humanity to his work, there's a grace to his work, there's a quiet dignity to his work. And everybody from Mark Badger to George Freeman to, to everybody wanted to take a shot at it. Um, everybody had the same experience. They would do the first couple of pages and it'd be kind of shaky and they're not sure this is going to work. And then by the time they got a, you know, a couple of pages in and they got the rhythm, they were like, yeah, this is working. Um, so, yeah, Shanauer, that was, if of all of the editorial assignments I made, both good and bad at DC, that was probably my, my best moment. Okay, you edited the last comic book iteration of the well-loved reference book, Who's Who. Yeah. Uh, can you give me any insight on why DC ended up abandoning the series, at least in a standard format? Uh, and did you have any involvement with the Loose Leaf? Uh, oh yeah, I wrote like two-thirds of the Loose Leaf, if not more. Uh, any, anything you give me, I would do. And I could do it in one draft, in one sitting, just boom, right out it goes. My finest, my, my fastest writing job ever wasn't that, but it was related. Uh, they did a bunch of trading cards around that time, early, early 90s. Uh, and they needed a certain number of words on the back with the character's origin, powers, history, and so forth. And there were 180 cards, and they needed them in 24 hours. And I just sat there, and I did like one every six minutes. It was just as fast as I could type. First draft theater, buddy. Just go, go, go. And I banged out 180 cards. It was great. Uh, I, had to, I also had to figure out what the art was on the front of the card. I didn't just a matter of that. I had to figure out what the character was doing on the front of the card, which also took time. So, um, But loose leaf... Who's who? Same thing. I would just I would eat that stuff up, um, and I gave Bob Greenberger a really hard time on the very first edition of the very first one because its special foldout was Atlantis, and it starts and Bobby wrote this, and it starts with the words, "Deep below the Pacific Ocean," <laughs> and we all froze. Bobby, where is Atlantis? <laughs> is it in the Pacific? Or is it in the Atlantic? <laughs> and I, I mocked him and mocked him and mocked him. And then Karma Graham for Mark Wade. Then I turned in an entry for Heat Wave, the Flash villain. And for whatever reason that day, as fast as I was going, and I know these characters like I know my own family. And when it came to Secret Identities, I did not write Mick Rory like I should have. I wrote Rory Calhoun, right. who is a famous... You know, Western star of the 1950s, and that's in print too. So guess what? I, you know, I screwed up too. Yeah. As far as the the, the print comic book edition, though, you did the editing on that. Yeah, I did a lot. Of, I mean, I did I did the whole Who's Who in the Legion. That was that was me, and then a lot of the editing on the last round of it. The last that we did like a five issue the updates updates at the end. Uh, and at that point, I think they just figured that that was the 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 whole point of it was to sort of codify the DC Universe because it was still molten after the, uh, the events of Crisis. And at that point, I think the feeling was, okay, everything's pretty much settled. We don't have a lot of updates to do. So I would have kept doing them. I love doing them. Any interesting stories from your brief stint as the Doom Patrol editor? As I'm sorry? Doom Patrol? Oh, I mean, only that it was the easiest job in the world. It's, it's a testament to the editorial philosophy that was handed down from Dick Giordano and that I still carry, which is the way to be a good at comics editor is hire the right people and just get the hell out of the way. And that way you get to home at 5 o'clock and there's great comic books out. That's, what, that's all you want. You don't want to have to get hire somebody you got to go in and fix. And Grant's a genius. I mean, all I had to do was take out all the U's because it was all <laughs> in, in British English. Uh, I had to go out and take out all the extra U's and change spellings every once in a while and that was it. It's the easiest job ever. How about the uh, Daily Planet Invasion newspaper replica? Yeah, that was me too. Man, because they were pulling, I did high school journalism. That was, you know, I, I was the only guy there who knew how to put together a high school newspaper. So that we had everybody on staff joined in on that. Brian Augustine did a lot of the newspaper strips, the comic strips in there. And, you know, Barbara Kiesel was there, Barbara Randall Kiesel. Um, you know, Art Young was a young editor working under Karen Berger as an assistant, uh, and he was in there. Karen Berger played Abby Cable. Uh, uh, the, w this was, you can see the terrible, terrible photo retouching on these photographs because this is before Photoshop, and 
we were just banging stuff out. Uh, but that we still, I still see that front page. DC uses that all the time. Earth, Earth, the aliens drop dead. They use that everywhere. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll probably circle back to this a few times just to make sure we've covered virtually every angle. What are your general thoughts on the Martian Manhunter? Look, I think he's cool. I think he's way underrated, and it's. I've always been a fan, partly because I like the underdog, you know. And I knew, I knew him as a character before he became just a Superman clone in terms of superpowers. So that the bad rap he got is, you know, just a fake Superman. It was not fair. Uh, I really got into Justice League about the time that he stopped being in the book, and. Uh, you know, I still remember reading the first the story where he leaves Justice League 71, where he leaves the Earth. Um, but he was such a tragic figure in my eyes. The, the last, you know, and the, I, and I, I was willing to give a pass to the fact that even though it's a unified universe, and even though you know he knows the Justice League, this idea that he can never get back home to Mars, even though Superman went to Mars every Thursday or whatever, I would just kind of give that a pass. You have to give that a pass. Um, but I like Zook. I like the, you know, I liked his kid brother Tom Jones. Oh, God, yeah. um, I am, I am all about the Martian Manhunter, and it was so exciting to see him finally get on the cartoon show. And after, you know, 30, 40 years of licensing, where the Justice League always forgot him when it came to licensing, he finally makes it big. So what does DC do at that exact moment? They change his costume. I was speechless. What are you doing? He finally gets the respect he deserves. He finally gets national recognition. Everybody in the world suddenly knows who he looks like for the first time in 50 years. So please, by all means, change his costume so it doesn't look like the guy on the cartoon show. Um, but he's, you know, he still gets respect. I think he gets more and more respect. The cartoon show obviously did a lot for his profile. Yeah. Oh, what I think is interesting, too, is in order for us to get the John Byrne post-crisis Superman, you really had to expunge a lot of Mort Weisinger's pathos, which I think John Jones ultimately in inherited. Inherited, that's true. because that's, And there is a lot of pathos to the Silver Age Superman that is forgotten. Uh, this is a tragic figure. And, and not so with John Superman, whose attitude was Krypton. Bah, who cares? Uh, yeah, but John picked up a lot of that. How much grief did you get for killing off ice? I, a justifiable amount of grief because it was well intended. It really was intended well, but we were looking for a way to shake up the, and do something big in the crossover event that was dictated to us, and it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Everybody loves ice. Let's shock people, but boy, do I regret doing that. It was just, it was, again, it was those were the times. It's like, you, you know, I would never do that today but we didn't know any better back then. Uh, I know Robert Greenberger did the Atlas of the DC Universe. Did you have anything to do with the creation of Middleton, Colorado, though? Yeah, that was me. Absolutely, yes. I did all the placements of the cities and all the thing, all, that entire section on where the cities fall, the maps, the details of the cities, the description. That's all me. Thank you. That was my section. And I, put him, and I put him specifically there because I know I wanted Robbie Reed, Dolly's for Hero Kid, to also be in the same state because they shared the book and it only made sense. Which you established in the secret, the uh, secret origin, uh, secret origins, uh, uh, Silver Age Sil crossover. Silver Age, Silver Age crossover. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting like a weird feedback. Sorry, it's just throwing me off a little bit. Impact Comics. Yeah. What do you think were the strengths and weaknesses of that line? And do you think you would ever have another relaunch in you, given your relationship with Archie Comics today? I, mean, I don't know. Oh man, I don't think I've got another re relaunch in me at this point. Um, I think that it was, again, Impact was well intended. It was made specifically for a slightly younger audience, but the problem is it looked like it was made for a specifically younger audience, and no kid wants to read his kind. Kid, every kid wants to read his big brother's comics. What, every kid wants to read what his big sister's reading or whatever. Uh, not, or her big sister or whatever. He's not reading what is age appropriate to him, and it was so clearly targeted toward kids uh, that it was well intended. I think the books are pretty good. Uh, everybody's heart was in it, but you could kind of tell you know, a few months in that this wasn't going to click. And then near the end, we did a sort of Hail Mary pass where it was, all right, you know, do Crucible, rip it all down, and then launch a whole new universe out of that. And Brian Augustine and I were going to do that. We had uh, scripts done, art was done on first issues of Comet and uh, Shield, and I forget the third one. Not Fly, oh, uh, I think. Uh, Comet, Shield... Uh... Oh, oh, wait, oh, I, um, uh... Not, I, anyway, okay. anyway, one yeah. one of them anyway and um, Black Hood Black Hood yes and never saw print so it's which is a shame 
Because that was, they said, it was too late by that time. I mean, we were trying to bring it up to a little more contemporary and a little more uh, adult reader friendly, but it was too late. You personally made me buy Legion of Superheroes Comics monthly for six years because I enjoyed your handful of issues on the reboot run. Why were your runs on Legion and JLTF so short uh, following Zero Hour? I, I remember that with the fo- fo- Zero Hour, with, with both books, I was just gearing up for Kingdom Come at that point. Things were starting to break my way. I was doing more work in Marvel. And it just seemed like a, a way to go. And also, the Legion was in great hands. I mean, Tom McCraw knew the stuff backward and forward, and Tom Pyre's great, and so they had it going. Um, I, you know, I do miss those books. It, it, the Legion reboot wasn't, I, it wasn't my favorite thing I ever did because I, 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 I people liked it, and we did some nice stuff. Well, but you, you to, which one? <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, the, the Archie. Well, then they okay. call the Archie Legion now. The one right after Zero Hour, because ultimately it was karaoke. That's what bothered me about it. It was karaoke. It was let's let's do the same Legion stories, but we'll tweak them slightly and do a little. But they're still basically the same Legion stories. Uh, whereas this, the other reboot I did with Barry Kitson was a lot more build it from the ground up. And boy, I that's that's my one great failure in comics. I feel like that's like I've done. I mean, I've blown a lot of other opportunities, and I've done a lot of books that didn't quite work. But that's the one. That's the one where I look at that and I go. No, this we hit it out of the park. We were really hitting, we were hitting homers every issue, and for whatever reason, it didn't click, and I'll never know why. Can you tell me a, a little bit about how Underworld Unleashed came about? Sure. I mean, we were looking for a summer crossover event. I had not done one yet, and it just came to mind that DC's villains were always a little weaker, if you will, not as quite as impressive and world dominating as D, as DC's villain as Marvel's villains were. Uh, you know, I think, and I wish I could take credit for this, but I think it was Roger Stern who said uh, Marvel has Galactus and DC has Matter Eater Lad, and that's sort of the the difference. Uh, so running into that, that made perfect sense. The only thing we had to change was it was called Underworld all along, but then we had that Underworld miniseries a few years before that that was a, just a four-issue crime series, and so we changed it Underworld Unleashed to make it work. Yeah, but that was a great deal of fun, too, and I'm, that one also goes completely forgotten for some reason. And I really feel like that was Howard Porter's dry run for JLA, too. Oh, yeah, and it looked great, and we used a special fluorescent green ink on that. Yeah, yeah. Did the Neuron name have any significance, or is it just a cool-sounding name? It was... I built it out of the fact that if you do the numerology, it really does spell 666. Blue Devil. Was yeah. it just because he's the devil that he got thrown under the bus on that series? Another mistake, I mean. Another another well-intended mistake, because I, I regret doing that, because it... He didn't have anything going. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't being done by his creators at that point. Uh, he need there was the feeling in the office he needed some sort of jolt or some sort of juice, uh, and so I thought what we did with him was good and interesting and 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 uh, consistent with the character. But at the same time, as somebody who has created other things in the DC universe and had a piano fall on them, you know, I kind of regret dropping a piano in somebody else's work. Uh, no, I'm running a little on time, so I want to I go ahead and uh, uh, just cut through a few of them. This is the other question I absolutely had to ask you. You wrote Just League uh, Midsummer's Nightmare. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the division of duties between yourself and Fabian Nicieza, and in particular, who was writing the Manhunter stuff? Uh, I believe Fabian was writing the Manhunter stuff. I, it suddenly occurs to me that that's the case. It was it was a pretty clean division. I mean, we talked all the time, and you know, we'd get on the phone and knock stuff back and forth, but it was... You know, I was handling, I think, the Superman stuff, the Green Lantern stuff, I think. Uh, he was handling the Wonder Woman stuff. Um, and it was just, and then we'd, we'd get in the office and we would just, like, not exactly type in the office, but we'd make notes and talk and build out the story in the office and then go back and do the finished scripts in our, you know. But that was kind of how it was broken out. But that was Fabian doing the, the Martians Manor stuff. It was great. It, there's that one moment where the uh, the Sparks, I think they were called, the, the people who gained superpowers, had re killed John Jones' family. Yeah. He begins to become the Martian Manhunter, and the leaguers were like, uh, we're asking, is he okay? And one of them's like, I, I've seen him before. If he's anything but okay. Yeah, yeah. Was that Fabian? That was Fabian. Because okay, that's the moment I became a Martian Manhunter fan. That was great. That's Fabian. You can thank Fabian Nicieza. I, I love the character for years, but that was the moment where, like, de- like Detective Kuyon in uh, Unusual Suspects, where all of a sudden it all came together for me. So I just want to know who to credit for that. Yeah. Um, yeah I really... I, uh, I don't want to rush No, I just don't want to hold these guys up. They're, they're here for their experience, too. Uh, if, if you don't want to break off, well, we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. But I just want to say, excellent work. Love your writing. Uh, I've got stuff for the next time you come to town. I'll ask you then. Absolutely. Again, if you want, let me grab these guys. If you want to follow up with just a couple sure. real quick. Yeah, let me get these. Okay. And yeah, please. I'm feeling yeah. terrible watching them. Find a, find a couple you. more. Okay.
while I was reading the excerpts from the comic book heroes, I had to strategically edit out the two creators who kept being intertwined with Mark Wade's portions, Kurt Busiek and Brian Augustin. While I was doing final editing on this episode of the podcast, Mark Wade put up a post on Facebook. It reads, this one hurts unimaginably. Brian Augustin, rest in peace. The Augustin family has asked me to let Brian's friends and fans know that Brian left us today after suffering a sudden, severe stroke over the weekend. I have spent a lot of time these last few hours writing a great deal about Brian, and I'll share those thoughts soon. But for now, I simply wanted to let everyone know, Comics has lost a very kind, very talented man who has been my big brother and one of my very best friends for nearly 35 years. If you've ever been a friend, colleague, or fan of Brian's, or frankly, a fan of the work done by Humberto Ramos, Mike Wieringo, Mike Perobeck, Oscar Jimenez, Howard Porter, Travis Charest, or any of the many, many other creators who owe their careers to Brian, myself included, I'm asking you to send a card or a note to his wife Nadine and daughters Carrie and Allie to express your condolences and tell them what he meant to you. I believe it would mean a lot to them. I thought I would go back to the book and read those portions that I skipped earlier. Wade and Augustine became instant soulmates, both Silver Age fans, both cocky and unintimidated by anybody, both used to being loudmouthed outsiders. Wade through fanographics, and Augustine through editing an independent humor comic called Troll Lords. Augustine, an ex-high school football player and printer's assistant from Chicago, was a direct type. His first day on the job, when an irritable editor referred to him as Mike Gold's flunky, Augustine grabbed him by the neck, lifted him to his tiptoes, and said, I've never been a flunky, do you understand? Dick Giordano was still laughing about it at the editorial meeting the next day. And just like in the comics, Augustine and the embarrassed editor went on to be friends. It had always been wholesome DC against hip Marvel, except that in the late 80s, wholesomeness meant the social and artistic conscience of Khan, Levitz, and Giordano, and hipness meant the aggression of Shooter, DeFalco, and New World Pictures. When Brian Augustine, a Chicago Democrat of the old school, pitched a short-term backup series about a liberal Mexican-American superhero named El Diablo, Jeanette Kahn said no. It should be an ongoing series of its own, she said, because it's the kind of thing we ought to do. It was a sincere act, and a brave one, which some commerce-minded staffers had little use for. Bruce Bristow in the marketing department was quoted by retailers as having told them, don't buy it, it's a stupid book. The lack of Latino creators was an obstacle, but the creators did their best. The doggedly political El Diablo sank like a rock, while Latino teenagers were buying Wolverine and Punisher. Brian Augustin had learned to play the commercial game better, and when he took over the Flash, he assigned Wade to write it. Wade focused on cloaking his Silver Age tastes in a darker, more continuity-driven style. Soon he was emerging as a hot writer. Brian Augustin and Mike Mignola did a Batman imaginary story called Gotham by Gaslight, 1989, which kicked off a whole line of Elseworlds projects, starring superheroes in various impossible settings. The Slings and Arrows comic guide opined that a frequent form of Batman graphic novels is Elseworlds tales, representing Batman as he might have been if born in different times or different circumstances, otherwise known as imaginary stories. Gotham by Gaslight set the trend, predating the Elseworlds tag, merging the Batman's origin with the story of Jack the Ripper in 1880s Gotham. Brian Augustine overwrites a little, but this doesn't undermine the strength of Mike Mignola and P. Craig Russell's atmospheric artwork. Augustine's sequel, Master of the Future, has a better script and some of Eduardo Barreto's best artwork. A madman threatens to destroy Gotham as it prepares an exposition to celebrate the dawn of the 20th century, and Bruce Wayne must decide whether to put on the costume again. In Flash Plus, Wally West and Dick Grayson's annual vacation is interrupted when they stumble upon a murder mystery come alien invasion. It's excellent superhero shenanigans from Mark Wade, Brian Augustine, and Eduardo Barreto. The life story is ostensibly the career of the Silver Age Flash, as related by his widow. In actuality, it's a slick retooling of the Barry Allen character to fine-tune the current continuity courtesy of writers Mark Wade and Brian Augustine, and artists Gil Kane, Joe Staten, and Tom Palmer, told in a combination of comics and prose. Of Operation Stormbreaker, they wrote, continuing the series of acclaimed event one-shots offering glimpses into pivotal events in their superhero mythos, this one introduces Dr. Tomorrow prior to his limited series and bands together a group of superheroes to fight the Nazis. Mark Wade and Brian Augustin turn in an enjoyable slugfest with crowd-pleasing knowing references to future continuity, while the art from Dougie Braithwaite and Robin Riggs is top-notch. Of Crimson, they wrote, scripted by Brian Augustin, co-created and drawn by Humberto Ramos, Crimson tells of spoilt yuppie brat Alex Elder, whose nose is firmly smacked by the rolled-up newspaper of life when a nighttime jaunt with his friends leaves them terminally shredded and himself turned into a vampire, and they opine that it was stylish and slick. Of the cliffhanger title Out There, Brian Augustin and Humberto Ramos obviously watched a few too many episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but that's not automatically a bad thing. This finely tuned and entertainingly diverting series follows the fortunes of four teenagers, prom queen, jock, geek, and indie goth girl, 
They discover that the adults of their small American town have made a deal with demons in order to maintain law and order. Thus begins a round of demonic showdowns, general weirdness, and a road trip across America under the guardianship of a female preacher and a mute war veteran. It's all good, clean fun. And finally, their review of JLA Year One. Mark Wade and Brian Augustine's script and Barry Kitson illustrates an excellent reworking of the early days of the Justice League of America. In DC's revised continuity, an alien invasion initially brought Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, Black Canary, and the Martian Manhunter together. And this is set following that event, nominally and fluidly, 10 years before the current adventures of the JLA. Wade and Augustine sparkle when contemporizing the classic moments of Justice League history. They manage to transfer their affection of the source material to a sharp, extended thriller, dealing with an involved plot by a game of rogue geneticists who plan to remake the world and the life forms upon it to the specifications of an unknown leader. The tension builds through the team slowly getting to know and trust each other, with plenty of contemporaneous guest stars such as the first Blue Beetle, the original Doom Patrol, and the Blackhawks. The finale is a superhero fan's dream as every hero on Earth unites to battle an all-out alien invasion and the solid, underplayed art from Kitson sucks the reader totally into a gripping climax. When it's done right, there's nothing wrong with being made to feel like you're 10 years old again. And I went with Brian, with Brian Augustine, who was, you know, a, a, a great friend and, and a great editor. And so, you know, it's, it's all right. Like, give him a second. Hang for a second. I'm sorry. Hang for a second. I didn't, hey, I didn't mean to be like, no, go away. I didn't mean that. But that, <laughs> that, that's not what I meant. Um, give, me, give me like another 20 minutes or so. Well, do you want to we'll no, break no, off for a minute? No, come back, come back around like 20 minutes or so. Is that okay? I'm sorry, it's all, it's all good. I, just, I, mean, I didn't mean it to sound like... <laughs> all right. um, um, 